Today on the Melbourne Report, here to stay, Ted Bailey shifts from opponent to salesman for the Mikey ticketing system. Who's the boss to hunt for the new Chief Commissioner and cutting the cost of building the government's plan to take on the unions? On Sky News and the Melbourne Channel, the Melbourne Report starts now. From the Sky News Melbourne studios in South Bank, this is the Melbourne Report with Aaron Young. Hello and welcome to the program. Also this week, the council banning outdoor smoking, which raises a question, where can you smoke? But first to this week's panel, Herald Sun Transport reporter Ashley Gardner, the opposition's attorney general Martin Bakula and the IPA's Tim Wilson. Well, we start today with a little green car that so far cost us $1.4 billion. Love it, loathe it, pay for it, my key is here to stay. But why did the government take so long to decide to keep it? And was all the blustering in opposition worth it? Ash, I'll start with you. Do you think the government was right by keeping Mikey? Well, I don't think they really had any choice. I mean, uh, Ted Bailey is not the first uh, uh, politician to be uh, handed Mikey. I'm thinking I'm sitting next to one, uh, one another <laughs> Mr. one Martin right, Bacula. right now. <laughs> um, it just would have been far too expensive to get rid of it. Get rid of it. We've moved, mm. you know, too far along in the process. Um, and what would have been the option? They just have to really um, refine it, make it work, but there was absolutely no way they could get rid of it, which is, I know, you know, it was time to get rid of it, but... Pretty expensive as well. Martin, what do you think about this? Did the government have any other choice? Well, look, the reality is um, Mikey's been operating on train, tram and bus in Melbourne now for 11 months. We went live in July last year. Um, and apart from, um, you know, the odd issue, it's actually worked pretty well. Uh, and you've got a situation... So was it just betting down? Is that your point? Well, well, there was all the well-publicised teething problems before we went live. There was the problems in terms of the increase in the costs and the time it took to get it live. But once it went live last year, um, I, you know, I was frankly um, quite pleasantly surprised by how it ran. We've seen um, take-up increase fairly consistently since then, and it would actually... Um, be taken up a lot more quickly if it weren't for the fact that you had Metcard and Mikey running concurrently. Mm. So that's actually depressing the usage of Mikey because you've still got the two systems. Well, the, the now opposition, the government at the time, when you were Transport Minister, you yeah. guys wanted to uh, get rid of Mike, uh, get rid of Metcard a, a lot sooner. Do you think the government now keeping it until the end of next year is going to uh, depress the take up, as you say, of Mikey even further? Well, well it's a very curious decision. Um, we had said that we keep Metcard to at least Easter, which has just gone past. Um, but if you were wanted to be charitable, even um, you know around about now, uh, the government's extending that by at least another 18 months. That's going to be very, very costly. It's going to compromise the system because Mikey will work better when it's a standalone system than with this. Why is that? Why is that? Well, you've got for instance, hybrid gates. Um, so at the moment, if you go through a gate, you've got you know Mikey use and Metcard use. You've got a few standalone Mikey gates that work at Southern Cross Station. But once the system is a single-use system rather than half one thing and half the other, it was always our view that it would work better. And keeping the two systems running concurrently will cost probably an okay. extra seventy-five or hundred million dollars. Tim, what are your thoughts? Do we give Mikey too hard a time at the start? Should we have just had a bit more patience and waited for it to bed down? Well, it's what the government's now trying to do is manage a transition towards a system. They've inherited a system that clearly has complications and problems as, to be fair, all ticketing systems, new ticketing systems do. Metcard but wasn't easy, was it? No, and, and uh, whatever succeeds Mikey, perhaps one day will face a similar challenge. The issue was the massive cost blowout in terms of what it was put to uh, cost the Victorian taxpayer and what it ended up costing the Victorian taxpayer. The important thing is that when we go to a full MyKey system that it works and that, it, uh, that we don't have the sort of complications and transition issues and I suspect that's as much behind the government's decision but to what delay. What about the image though of the government now doing a backflip on MyKey? They've been as I say blustering about it for such a long time in opposition. Now suddenly they say well we're going to keep it and the, and the Premier's now turned into a, a spokesperson for the device. Uh, do you think that will have a, a lasting impact in the minds of voters? I don't think it will because I think most voters are smart enough to think, okay, fine, you dump my key, we well, just got to develop a whole new system what which now, yeah. costs all a lot of money as well. So faced with the very political and um, financial reality uh, that this government has, they really had no other choice. They didn't um, say that in opposition though, did well, they? Well, uh, go governments and oppositions always say different things at different times, but well, what their job the now what, what their job now is to get it to work and to work successfully because whether Martin is responsible for all of the disasters before the election, anything that happens now ultimately is their responsibility by the result of this announcement. Martin, does uh, Labor involved ever, uh, regret ever getting involved with Mikey now? Look, I think the reality is, um, as Tim says, new ticketing systems always are 
problematic. Um, Metcard, I went back through the some of the commentary about Metcard and it, you'd be amazed at how similar it was. But Metcard still exists at the moment. Do you think there's anyone in Labor who perhaps blames Mikey for losing the election and says we might as well not have even uh, taken on the challenge of a new ticketing system, Le leave it for the next mob? Well, well the reality is we, you know, we had to take on the challenge of a new ticketing system um, and that's what governments are elected to do. Um, Metcard was going to get close to the end of its natural life by about 2012 uh, and the longer you wait the harder it is and the more costly it is to replace okay, it. So Ash, Ash, final word? Um, well, they just need to get this working pretty soon or otherwise they will be in trouble. This is now Ted Bailey's problem. This is now Terry Mulder's problem. It's, mm. uh, you know, the time to blame the previous government is now over. All right, well, as always, we wanted to know what you think about the issue, so Susan Wilson hit the streets to find out what you think with your say. It's not exactly the world's most popular ticketing system. Mikey is best known for extreme delays, serious teething problems and billion dollar cost blowouts. But the Bailey government has decided to keep it anyway. We hit the streets of Melbourne to ask people if it made the right decision. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, it never works. Like Whenever there's a queue down here to, to get in, it's always because people's Mikeys aren't swiping. Every single day there's... You know, if you ever have to go to a different um, entry point, it's always because of Mikey. You cannot carry it for one whole month. It like shrinks, shrinks, and like it distorts. And I think they need to put some more trams on and need to put some more trains on rather than fussing around with the ticket system. But the only thing is, it's not so very eco-friendly. They're having these plastic cards, and that waste. But it's good. It's rechargeable. It's good. No one uses it, and it's not effective. And yeah, there's no point having two systems when the old one works. Just because more needs to be um, invested in terms of infrastructure, um, yeah, I don't think ticketing is um, the main preference. So, so that, that's why, um, yeah, I, I just think that the whole thing has been a mess, quite frankly. Well, it's been a week since Simon Overland quit as police commissioner, and so the obvious question now is who should replace him? Gary Jamison's job application was splashed across the Herald Sun last Saturday, but many within the force believe a whole new team is needed to move on and forget the past. But would an interstate or an overseas candidate command the respect of the force? I'll start with you this time, Martin Bakula. What do you think is needed for a new chief commissioner here? Well, look, I think um, a new Chief Commissioner will be someone, it needs to be someone of the highest integrity, um, who understands the nature of the Victorian Police Force. But, look, I'm not going to get into the business of uh, telling the new government who their Chief Commissioner should be. Um, they're obviously going to go through an application process. We're certainly hopeful that it will be a proper, fulsome process. Um, Better than Labor's? Or? Well, well, certainly better than the way they treated the previous Chief Commissioner and better than the, you know, the bogus process that they went through um, to spear the Chief Commissioner, which was clearly what they always wanted to do. Uh, and the involvement of the Premier's office in all of that, I think, was um, a shameful chapter in this government's brief history. Tim, on the Thursday we saw the assassination, then the next day we saw the funeral. A lot of people were coming out, particularly Jeff Kennett. Uh, what do you think of his thoughts? He said that it was a dark day for Victoria. Uh, do you think Jeff Kennett could ever be accused of playing politics with the role of police commissioner when he was Premier? Uh, well, I don't know whether he could be or not. I have to say, I'd be jumping my mind to remember what he said when he was Victorian Premier. But the reality is... Uh, this government needs to appoint somebody who has a level of trust and respect amongst the Victorian community. The police uh, force and its culture is an incredibly challenging uh, and unique institution within our society because of the fact that it has both the capacity to enforce the law um, but also needs to command the respect of the government and the people in the process of doing that to make sure that there's ongoing trust. So I think they need to make a very sound judgment based on those very basic principles. I suspect they're going to be better off promoting from within, but there is no, you know, there are plenty of candidates, I'm sure, who will put their hands up. But there's a giant but review. My point about that is there's a huge review now, which is being conducted by Jack Rush into exactly uh, how the management system is within Victoria yeah. Police. Doesn't that cast a huge shadow on people like Gary Jamison, on, on others like Ken Lay, for example? Well, I don't think any candidate should be out there trying to get attention to themselves and their candidacy. I think it will be a massive backfire on them. And yes, there is this issue. Culturally, uh, uh, an institution like the police uh, is di very different. As a consequence, there does need to be a proper assessment about whether the culture is right. 
but at the same time importing somebody from outside has these complications as well when you put them into a new system to yep. drive that change throughout an organisation. So they're going to have a hard, a hard time finding the right candidate, but the one they do get is going to have to command a lot of respect and trust with the Victorian people and of course the government if they want to get the job. Ash, what are your thoughts? We've had two interstate candidates the, the past couple of times. Well, where should we go from here? Well, I think the government's in a real bind over this because if you appoint someone from outside, from day one, the boys' club inside the police are going to start mm. tearing that candidate down. They're an outsider straight yeah. away. If you appoint an insider, the danger is that that old culture will never be changed. And that's the thing we're forgetting about Christine Nixon and uh, Simon Overland. They did actually start working to change that culture. There's been a lot of calls for, you know, let's bring back old style policing. Yeah, sure. You know, that's booting people up the bum. You know, that's some, um, you know, bashing people. Sure. Is that what we want? Shooting people? Um, that's old style policing and I think uh, you know time's over for that. We don't want to go too far right wing is what you're saying. Well uh, yeah we don't want to go back to those uh, those sort of that old style kind of uh, policing where there's just uh, a lack of accountability covering up for uh, the bad behavior of police and that's what outsiders do but uh, you know as soon as an outsider is appointed I am absolutely certain that the undermining campaign will okay. I to say though I think it's a mischaracterization to say that uh, old school policing is right wing or it's left wing the reality is when you give people the power to enforce the law, sometimes they will exercise that in an inappropriate way and of course that should be condemned uh, and dealt with. But uh, that's why it's the unique nature of these organisations such as a police force and they need to make sure that they're held to account every step of the way. We do need a police force that's in touch with the community. We need them to be upholding the law and recognise where the limitations of their role ends. And that is a cultural dimension to uh, the challenge that the Victorian government faces uh, and they will continue to do so irrespective of who's in power uh, or, the, or how the uh, institution develops over time. Okay, I want to talk a bit about prisons now if we can because yesterday we saw an article in The Age about how the Department of Justice wanted to see a new high security prison built. He said that, or they said that uh, the Acacia unit is now over 20 years old. You have a lot of people who are mixed in together. Ash, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's uh, one thing that we need to really get, get control of in the community to stop uh, you know, stop the need for more prisons and I think that people should stop committing crimes. If we can do that, um, if we can somehow get that going... An easy going, challenge. Which might be linked to our Chief Commissioner. So, so I guess the serious part of that is, you know, what are the causes of crime? Let's start really looking at that. I don't think enough is being okay. done to really look at those issues. All right. Well, don't forget the Melbourne Report is fully interactive. You can tweet us at Melbourne Report or send us an email to melbourne at skynews.com.au. Still to come, the Premier tells the Melbourne Report why he's going head-to-head -head with the unions. We will be back after this. And we're back. Welcome back to the Melbourne Report. Joining us at the desk this week, the Herald Sun's transport reporter, Ashley Gardner, the opposition's attorney general, Martin Pakula, and the IPA's Tim Wilson. Well, we spoke about the massive cost of Mikey before, but it seems that every government project now comes with a giant price tag, from the generous contracts for desal plant workers to the costly Frankston bypass. We wonder whether co the cost of construction is leading to a decline in government projects. Our reporter, Susan Wilson, spoke exclusively with Premier Ted Bailey. We're putting the facts on the table that the escalating construction cost in Victoria in particular is tending to price us out of infrastructure of the future. It is now very evident that very steep uh, construction costs in a number of projects are now migrating to other future projects. That simply means that we won't be able to afford to do some of those projects. We will all end up worse off uh, if that uh, is to continue. But are there other factors involved other than the unions? Well obviously whenever a deal is struck there are two sides to the deal. What we want to say is that in terms of government uh, projects there will be new industrial principles associated with construction jobs and we'll be procuring on that basis. You've said that the review will look at guidelines that have operated on a Commonwealth level. Will they be Howard Government Guidelines or Gillard Government Guidelines? Well, there are Commonwealth, gu there are Commonwealth Guidelines in place now which are uh, more expansive than the current Victorian ones. There were uh, other guidelines in place before the Gillard Government. We will be drafting new guidelines mindful of all of these uh, uh, other uh, examples and then we'll be putting that out for comment. Uh, before we finalise. Freedom of association and the right to join or not to join a union, will that be the major focus? Well, I'm not singling anyone out, but that's certainly 
uh, an element in the Commonwealth's guidelines over, the, over uh, recent years, which is not there in the Victorian ones. The Victorian uh, principles were rewritten in 2003, and they're pretty skinny. And we want to tighten that up and apply that to construction projects and see that uh, government project, projects uh, comply with those guidelines. Is this all designed to prevent the kind of industrial action that we've seen at the desale plant over the past few weeks? Well, the desale plant contracts were put in place obviously a long time ago. What we know about the desale plant is regardless of when any, whether any water is actually supplied, this is going to cost Victorians uh, nearly $2 million a day ex every day for the next 30 years. Uh, and that's before any water is supplied. So this is an incredibly expensive project and the rates that uh, have been established there are now migrating to other projects and that means that some projects, other, some other projects may not proceed and we will all be worse off given that we have a significant uh, infrastructure shortfall in Victoria. Okay, that's a Premier's view. Tim Wilson, I'll start with you. What do you think? Has the government got it right here? What are they trying to do? Ultimately, what they're trying to do is control costs as much as anything else. What we've seen is they've inherited a large number of projects from the previous government that are very expensive and are bad value for the Victorian taxpayer. So what they're trying to do is find an arrangement where they uh, commission new projects uh, and their, their costs are going to be controlled based on what are the reasonable standards that, and, and uh, entitlements that most Victorians enjoy in their uh, in their employment contracts rather than very generous arrangements for union workers uh, and, uh, and unionists who get a, an extra big deal out of a lot of the projects from the previous government. It's as simple as that. Martin, you can of course speak on behalf of the previous government and also the unions. What do you think the Premier is trying to do here? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speak on behalf of the opposition, uh, Aaron. <laughs> the, um, look, there's a couple of points that I think we should make. One of the things that's bidding up the cost of construction generally is the mining boom in Western Australia. It's uh, certainly bidding up the cost of labour across the country. I think what the Premier's got to be very careful of is the government not um, getting itself involved in the industrial arrangements of private companies and unions um, by trying to put an industrial you know, a philosophical industrial overlay and getting itself in the middle of arrangements because what ultimately has happened uh, in the federal system uh, is that um, companies that have arrangements they're quite happy with with unions um, find themselves being compromised by a federal government agenda and now a state government agenda um, risks becoming part of that as well. Uh, and I think um, we've got to be very careful that this isn't about ideology rather than specifically about the cost of projects and about the ability of companies and unions to do the sort of deals that suit them. You make a good point about Western Australia there, Ash. We seem to see a starting point of a billion dollars for projects these days. It's almost every project starts off that way. Uh, what, what, have we gone too far? And then it gets bigger and bigger. But this is a, uh, this is a good old-fashioned union bashing exercise. This is what Liberal governments do. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think people will welcome this. There's a lot of resentment out there that people hear about the uh, huge uh, wages that some of the desal workers are on. So I think that this, uh, this is a move that will be welcomed in the community. And now the CFMEU has said that they want those conditions for the desal workers to spread across the construction mm. industry. Is that something that's viable? Oh, well, this is another try on from the CFMEU, like, you know, some of the I guess, uh, most notorious industrial dinosaurs that are out there. Um, but is that why the government, as you say, is bashing the unions? Is it because of that sort of rhetoric from the unions? Well, it, it, it works both ways. There's a you know, push in one direction and then a push in the other. It's just mm. a cycle. So, um, but, but there is an issue with escalation, which is if you get st inflated standards on one project, then you transfer it over to all other projects. The cost of all those projects ultimately will be much more expensive and blow out as a consequence. Well, well, now, what should be decided right. between... It doesn't, private, mean, it doesn't mean they get it. No, that's true, but what should be decided, I agree with you Martin, the government shouldn't unnecessarily interfere between the contracts of private companies and individuals, or if people choose to, uh, to negotiate through their union voluntarily, that is also uh, a good principle which we should apply, but the government does have an interest when it's their projects and they're going to have to finance the consequences of that um, to affect, to, uh, to realise that's going to have an effect it, it, on the price. Except when you talk about desal, the costs of that enterprise agreement were borne by Tease, were borne by the contractor. The PPP had already been put in place, the cost of the PPP was in place, and the EBA was struck some time later, and all of that risk was borne by the contractor. 
this is going to be Ted's chance to really um, put his stamp on something here. If he can uh, produce some results with this, if his government can actually do something, then um, he can really, uh, you know, declare himself to be an authoritative premier. Which have I a bit more cash to get some moment. stuff done. Yeah, we could uh, maybe buy a new ticketing system or something. New ticketing like system. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you live in the Borbor Shire, you might find it hard to light up a smoke from here on in because your council has become the first in Victoria to put a blanket ban on smoking in outdoor dining areas. We're not supporters of big tobacco on the show, but we'll ask the question, where can people smoke? Tim Wilson, I will start with you on this topic. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think that councils are going too far? Well, I think you know, tobacco kills, it's pretty obvious, but and I'm supportive of voluntary um, measures where uh, businesses decide not to allow people to smoke, um, but at the same time I'm also supportive of competitive governance, and I don't think we see enough of things being done on a local level, trialled, and then seen how they may be replicated elsewhere if they're effective. So I think it's an interesting idea, but uh, basically in answer to your question, where can people smoke increasingly in their own homes, and that's about it. Ash? Well, I think uh, this is worth trying. I, I guess uh, Warrigal and Drew, one of the last places I would have uh, thought to be the forefront of the uh, the push um, against, against tobacco, against, <laughs> uh, against tobacco. But um, uh, it will it will further discourage people from smoking. I mean, I know a lot of nanny state arguments are put uh, put in against uh, uh, these sort of rules, but I think uh, the reality is people love the nanny state. People like to be nanny. People like to have their rules, uh, sorry, their lives ruled by governments. It's uh, it's quite obvious. So uh, the government is the answer to everything. I, I'm not sure everybody does agree with that. But there the clearly, there clearly are some people who do like the influence of government in their lives. Martin Bacor, do you like the influence of government in your life at the moment? Um, not as much as I did six <laughs> months ago, Aaron. <laughs> Can I say, look, I think one of the things this throws up, though, is the inconsistency that we're going to see across the state. You've got some councils that have banned smoking on beaches. Now you've got bauble banning it at cafes. I think what it might lead to is the need for the state government to have something consistent because you could quite genuinely end up with a situation where you can smoke at a cafe on one side of a road and not smoke at a cafe on the other side of but a road. But can't the state government sit back and watch? It's almost like a testing ground to see which one works best. Well, 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 well I must say, I think one of the one of the advantages of what is doing is that we'll actually be able to measure the impact of this on for instance, the local businesses, um, and that might be a very useful thing for government, but it might also mean as, as council after council puts in place its own rules, the state might have to do something a little bit more holistic. Tim, do you think there's any evidence to show that all these sorts of measures that are being put in place by the government and by councils are actually leading to any change in the, uh, the amount of people who smoke? Well, there are different measures which have different effects, and that's what's been shown over time uh, in terms of uh, changing effects. I doubt banning it in outdoor dining is designed to actually stop, uh, or sorry, in, in dining period is designed to stop uh, people smoking mm. because uh, the main issue I think for most people is secondhand smoke when they're um, sitting yeah, outside and, and consuming, uh, someone next to them is consuming a cigarette. So There's a couple of tourist town, tourism towns that are taken in here. Do you think it'll have any effect on, on tourism at uh, these sorts of places? Uh, look, I don't think people are going to make a judgement call where they go based on um, whether they can smoke in, in dining. Um, but I do think people will start to wonder, including um, a lot of people uh, who are visitors, to say, well, you know, I'm constantly going place in Australia and I can't do things I want and there have been claims uh, uh, internationally that Australia is leading the world and uh, Ash raised it, the, the nanny state pathway and we may uh, see other people start to express that view if they feel they come to Australia and not express themselves or, or live up to their liberties as they would like. Martin, final word on this one? Oh, well, look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's no doubt, Tim's right, cigarette smoking is a major health problem. Uh, the federal government's, uh, you know, under fire at the moment for bringing in plain packaging laws, which I think is groundbreaking uh, and certainly a world first. Uh, and in regards to outdoor dining, um, as I said, I think um, it's interesting what Borbore's doing, but um, ultimately, you know, we're going to probably have a need for some consistency across jurisdictions in this state um, mm. so that consumers know where they can and where they can't smoke. Okay. All right, well, finally this week, if you're a fan of the ballet, then you'll be glad to hear the Arts Centre is hosting the Merry Widow from Australian Ballet. Matt Bendel went along for Out and About. 36 years after its world premiere, right here in Melbourne, the Australian Ballet is again taking on Franz Lehar's The Merry Widow. What's changed in the 36 years since The Merry Widow premiered? 
Um, well, choreographically, not much, but um, I guess what happens is each time you bring this ballet back, it gets refined and polished, and, and with a whole new cast of dancers, it's always a very different show. So um, we've refurbished all of the, um, the costumes for this season, so they're just like brand new, like they were back in 75, and um, we've also had John Meehan and, and Marilyn Rowe, the original cast, um, in with us to rehearse the production. John's he overseen the whole production. What is it about the show that still resonates with contemporary audiences? I think it's pure escapism. It's a love story. It's a comic love story. So there's something that you can laugh at, something you can cry about. Um, it has glorious, glorious dancing in it. And it's a very elegant and glamorous work. What can people coming to the show expect to see? I think this show is pure entertainment. It is a fantastic love story. It's a lot of really elegant and beautiful dancing. So it's, it's the sort of thing that won't, um, uh, it won't be complicated, but it's got the most glorious score, the most beautiful visual design and fabulous dancing. The Merry Widow is currently running for a limited season at the Arts Centre in Melbourne. And this is Matt Bendel reporting for Out and About. Matt Bendel there, thanks so much to this week's panel. We'll see you soon and that is the show for this week. We hope you made it to your destination this week. If you were stuck at the airport, we'll be back again next week with another edition of the Melbourne Report. I'm Aaron Young. Have a great weekend.